Let's discuss notice of shareholder meetings. Uh, a shareholder is entitled to advance notice of shareholder meetings. Now, it can't be too far in advance. Your corporate law statute will set the parameters. How far in advance must it be, and how far in advance can it not be? It doesn't, you can't give it too far in advance. Um, let's talk about some important concepts associated with notice of shareholder meetings. We'll talk about the record date. We'll talk about the record owner or the shareholder of record. And we'll talk about waiver of notice of shareholder meetings. First, let's talk about the record date. The record date is the date that is set, usually in the bylaws, uh, of who is entitled to notice. The shareholders of record at this date, they are entitled to notice of the meeting. So this is the idea. If the, if the record date is March 1st, then the corporate secretary will look and see who the shareholders are as of March 1st, and those shareholders will receive notice of the shareholder meeting. What might happen? Well, there might be a transfer of shares uh, after March 1st, but before the shareholder meeting. That new shareholder is not entitled to notice of the shareholder meeting. The shareholder of record, as of the date, uh, as of the record date, that is the shareholder who is entitled to notice and entitled to vote the shares, even though she has transferred the shares afterwards. Um, let's talk about what it means to be a record owner or a shareholder of record. Clearly from the last example, you understand that if you are in the uh, corporation's uh, list of shareholders, shareholder ledger, as of the record date, you are a shareholder of record. But interestingly enough, the shareholder of record on the corporate books may not be the actual beneficial owner of the shares. So let's talk about three situations where the beneficial owner of the shares will not be the shareholder of record. First, in a voting trust. Remember what a voting trust is? I give my shares, I actually transfer my shares to a trustee, right? And several other shareholders will do this too. I will transfer my shares to a trustee. The trustee will then vote those shares according to uh, the trust agreement. This is a voting trust. The trustee will be the actual shareholder of record on the corporation's books. Uh, transfer after a record date. So imagine that the record date is March 1st and you are the shareholder of record as of March 1st, and the shareholders meeting is going to be on April 1st. So you are the shareholder of record as of March 1st. Sometime between April, March 1st and April 1st, you transfer the shares to me, right? Well, now you are the shareholder of record, but I am the beneficial owner of the shares. Who gets notice of the meeting? You do even though you are no longer the shareholder. You are the shareholder as of the record date. Who gets to vote those shares? You do. Why? Because you are the shareholder of record as of the record date. Finally, shareholders in public corporations are not usually the shareholders of record in the corporation's books. So for example, I own shares in Microsoft. If you go to Microsoft's book of send records and you look at the shareholder ledger, I am not mentioned anywhere there. Why? Well, if I were the shareholder of record, and you can be, you might be, but it's very, very rare. If I were the shareholder of record, for me to transfer my shares, it would be a big deal, right? I would have to take the shares and the share certificate, endorse them on the back, uh, send them to the purchaser, or, or, right? And the purchaser would then have to send them to Microsoft's corporate secretary. The corporate secretary would have to then go in the books and records, change the name of the owner, and then issue a new share certificate to the new owner. That would take a lot of time. What happens now is just electronic. So my shares in Microsoft are not held in my name. They're held in the name of a nominee who holds the shares on my behalf. And the nominee 
is usually a company called CD and Co. So when I transfer my shares, I just give notice to CD and Co. CD and Co. does not have to give any notice to Microsoft that I have transferred the shares. Now, what happens? Well, federal law requires that when uh, the company gives notice of the shareholder meeting, the company will naturally give it to CD and Co., the nominee who is holding the shares uh, on my behalf. And then CD and Co., under the law, is required to send that notice to me. Uh, finally, let's talk about waiver of notice. So uh, maybe I didn't receive advance notice of the shareholder meeting, but I can waive notice. And there are two ways that I can waive notice. I can waive notice expressly. I can say, I did not receive advance notice of this shareholder meeting, but I am waiving notice of this meeting. I can do it expressly or I can do it uh, in writing. Uh, written waivers of notice are very common in closely held businesses. So think about it. It's you and a couple other shareholders, and you might decide a matter sitting in a restaurant. And you say, okay, well, that was our shareholders meeting. And then you think about it. You never received notice of that meeting. You didn't receive it, whatever, 30 days in advance. So what you'll do is you'll prepare a waiver of notice of meeting. Otherwise, there could be some deficiencies, some defects with that meeting, and someone might challenge uh, the actions that happened at the meeting. One of the other shareholders might challenge the action. So, so they can do everything clean cut without any problems. You would have each of the shareholders sign a waiver of notice of the meeting. Um, a shareholder can implicitly waive notice of the meeting. How? By attending the meeting and not objecting to the lack of notice, right? So if you're a shareholder and you did not receive advance notice of the meeting, you had a right to advance notice and you can challenge anything that happens at that shareholder's meeting because you did not get advance notice. But if you attend the meeting and you do not object to lack of notice, then you have implicitly waived the notice. All right, let's talk about electing directors. We know shareholders elect directors. How do they do this? Well, they do this through a process called straight voting. Straight voting is the default method of electing directors. Uh, the corporation can change it if they want, uh, but let's talk about exactly how straight voting works. And this is, it's fairly important, and we'll discuss why it's important. But let's first discuss uh, what exactly straight voting is. So here's an illustration. Imagine we are going to elect five directors. There are five director seats up for election at this meeting, and we are going to elect five directors. Now, imagine there are nine candidates. There are nine nominees for the five seats. Um, the way the voting works is that none of these nominees will have to receive a majority to be elected to the board. Basically, it's a plurality. The five nominees out of the nine who receive the most votes, they win. They win the board seats. So how will we vote? Well, a shareholder, imagine I'm a shareholder in this corporation. I can vote yes for five nominees. I don't get any no votes. I get to vote yes for five nominees. So there are nine nominees there, only five board seats. When I vote my shares, I can vote yes for five of them, and for the rest of them, I just don't vote on. So I only get five yes votes. So how many yes votes will you get? You will get uh, as many yes votes as there are director seats up for election. Now, why is cumulative voting, excuse me, why is straight voting significant? Well, straight voting is significant because under straight voting, the majority shareholder will always be allowed, will always be able to elect the entire board of directors. So let's just have a very simple example. So imagine we have ABC Corporation and ABC Corporation has 1,000 shares 
issued and outstanding. You notice I didn't ask about authorized shares. It's unimportant. When you're voting, it's only the issued and outstanding shares that will vote. So ABC Corporation has 1,000 shares issued and outstanding. And imagine we have a majority shareholder and a minority shareholder. But they're still very close in their, their uh, shareholdings. So the majority shareholder uh, holds 501 shares. And the minority shareholder holds 499 shares. They're going to now elect the board of directors. Just looking at this, you'd say, how many seats, how many directors could the minority shareholder elect? And you say, well, the minority shareholder, they could elect a lot of directors. Why? Because they have 499 shares. Well, that's not the case. In this case, the majority shareholder will be able to elect the entire board of directors. So this is how it works. Imagine there are five board seats up for election. And majority shareholder has five nominees that she wants to elect. Let's say majority shareholder wants to elect A, B, C, D, and E. These people, the, these nominees, the majority shareholder would like to elect them to the board of directors. Minority shareholder has one nominee that she wants to elect, nominee X. And maybe X is herself, it doesn't matter. Minority shareholder wants to elect just one nominee to the board of directors. And she thinks, surely I have 499 out of the 1,000 shares that can be voted. Surely I can elect one director to this uh, board of directors when there are five board seats open. And the answer is she won't be able to. Look how the voting will work. So um, A, how many votes will nominee A get? Well. The majority shareholder is going to vote her 501 shares. She's going to vote yes for her five nominees. So she's going to vote 501 shares yes for A. She's going to vote 501 shares yes for B. And the same for her nominees C, D, and E. She will vote her shares yes for A, B, C, D, and E, these nominees. So each of those nominees will receive 501 yes votes. Minority shareholder is going to vote 499 uh, yes votes for nominee X. So what's the rule? Well, the rule is that the top five vote getters, in this case, we only have five board seats open for election. So we look at the top five vote getters. Who are the top five vote getters? A, B, C, D, and E are the top five vote getters. X got a lot of votes but not enough votes to be elected to the board of directors. And this is why under straight voting, the majority shareholder can elect the entire board of directors. No matter how big the board is, the minority shareholder under straight voting will be able to elect the entire board of directors. All right, so let's talk about a voting alternative, an alternative to straight voting, and it's called cumulative voting. Now, under cumulative voting, a minority shareholder with a sufficient number of shares will be able to elect at least one director, and maybe more, depending on how many shares the minority shareholder has. So how do we vote under cumulative voting? Well, for every share I own, I get one vote times the number of board seats up for election. Let's look at an illustration. So we go back to our same illustration. Uh, we have five director seats up for election. Let's say that shareholder A, in this case, owns 25 shares. Well, how many votes will shareholder A get? Well, it's 25 shares times the number of board seats up for election. So that's 25 times five, 25 shares times five board seats up for election, shareholder A will get 125 votes. Now, the beauty of cumulative voting is that shareholder A can do whatever she wants with these 125 votes. She can put them all on one nominee, or she could spread them over two or more nominees. But if she's smart and she wants to try and elect at least one director to the board of directors, she will cumulate she will vote all of her 125 votes in favor of 
one nominee. This will give her the best chance to get at least one representative on the board of directors. Um, once again, the same basic idea. The nominees with the most number of votes win election to the board of directors. All right, let's look at the significance of cumulative voting. We said the significance is, is that a minority shareholder under a cumulative voting regime will be able to elect one director or maybe more if she has enough shares. So let's go back to our example where we have ABC Corporation with 1,000 shares issued in outstanding. The majority shareholder has 501 shares and the minority shareholder has 499 shares. We said that under straight voting, the majority shareholder is going to be able to elect the entire board of directors and the minority shareholder will not be able to elect even one director. But under cumulative voting, this minority shareholder will be able to elect at least one director and maybe more. But let's just go through with it, her trying to elect one director. So there are five board seats up for election. So now we have to ask how many votes does each of the shareholders get? Well, the majority shareholder will get 2,505 uh, 2, votes. Where did I get that number? Well, remember, under cumulative voting, we count votes. And the number of votes you get is the number of shares you have times the number of directors up for election. So here, majority shareholder has 501 shares. There are five directors up for election. 501 times five is 2505, 2505. So majority shareholder will have 2505 votes when she uh, votes for directors. Uh, the minority shareholder will have 2495 votes. Where did I get that number? It's just 499, her number of shares uh, times the number of board seats up for election, which is five. So she will have 2,495 votes to vote when she votes for a director. Now, remember what she can do, and the majority shareholder can do this too. You can take your votes and you can spread them out over several directors, several nominees, or you can concentrate all your votes and vote for one nominee. Let's say that minority shareholder is going to do that. Minority shareholder is going to take all of her votes and vote them on one nominee. A majority shareholder is going to spread them out over five uh, nominees. So this is the voting results. Um, the majority shareholder votes her shares, spreads them out over five nominees. The minority shareholder uh, puts all of her shares on one nominee. So remember, the rule is that the nominees with the most votes are elected to the board. So clearly, X is elected to the board of directors, and there is a tie among the uh, nominees that the majority shareholder wants but only four of those will be on the board because we only have four, uh, five board seats. So under this voting regime and under this scheme, minority shareholder will be able to get at least one representative on the board of directors. All right, now you may ask yourself, how many directors can I elect under cumulative voting if I have a certain number of shares? In our previous example, we saw that the minority shareholder put all of her shares on one candidate and was able to elect one candidate to the board of directors using cumulative voting. But what if she had spread them over two candidates? Would she have been able to elect two persons to the board of directors. Well, there's a formula that you can use to determine how many directors you can elect using cumulative voting. And it is a formula that law professors have tortured law students with uh, since
time immemorial. So I am going to continue that tradition. All right, so this is the formula and you just have to punch in the numbers. You just kind of have to know what the numbers, uh, what each of these things mean. So total number of shares entitled to vote. You have to know how many shares will be entitled to vote at this shareholders meeting times the number of directors you want to elect. If you want to elect one director, you put in one here. If you want to elect two directors, you put in two here, etc. Divided by the number of board seats up for election plus one. So if there are five board seats up for election, it would be five plus one. And then once you do that, you add one or round up to the nearest whole number. Let's run through an example to make it easier. All right, so remember our fact patterns that we had ABC Corporation with 1,000 shares issued and outstanding. Our majority shareholder had 501 shares. Our majority shareholder had 499 shares. There are five board seats up for election. Our minority shareholder wants to know how many board seats can I get with my 499 shares if I use cumulative voting? Uh, can I only get one? Can I get two? Can I get three? All right, well, let's apply the formula. So let's say that our minority shareholder wants to elect two directors. Will she be able to get two directors? Well, remember the formula is total number of shares entitled to vote. How many shares are entitled to vote in this shareholder election? Excuse me, in this board election? Well, there are 1,000 shares issued and outstanding. That means total number of shares entitled to vote, 1,000. Times number of directors you want to elect. And we said we're going to try and see if our minority shareholder can elect two directors. So it's 1,000 times two divided by the number of board seats up for election plus one. Look at the formula back up at the top. The number of board seats up for election plus one. Well, how many board seats are up for election? Well, our fact pattern says there are five, five board seats up for election plus one. That is five plus one. So that is 1,000 times two, which is 2,000, divided by five plus one, which is six. So 2,000 divided by six equals 333.333. Now, we're not finished. There's that other plus one. So at this point, you either add one or round up to the nearest whole number. So if our number came up just 333 round, flat, then we would round it up to, we would go up to the next number 334. But in this case, because we have 333.333, .333, we don't add one to make it 334.333. We just round it up to the nearest whole number, right? Which gives us 334. What does the number 334 mean? Well, it means under cumulative voting in this corporation, a minority shareholder would need 334 shares to elect two directors. How many shares does a minority shareholder have? 499. So our minority shareholder has plenty of shares in this corporation to elect two directors to the five-person board, uh, more than enough shares. Uh, now, the question would be, could she do three? And I've done the formula and she could not elect three directors. You can do that formula on your own. You can do 1,000 times three divided by six and you find out that she does not have enough shares to elect three directors, but she has enough shares to elect two directors. So she would take her votes. Remember, she'll have a certain number of votes. In this case, she will have 2,495 votes. She would take those votes and spread them among two nominees. And she would be able to elect those two nominees to the board of directors. And naturally, the majority shareholder would get to elect the other three board seats.
All right, what is a staggered board? Sometimes it's called a classified board. I prefer to call it a staggered board. Um, a staggered board is where not all of the directors are up for election each year. The default rule is that every year, every director will be up for election. Under a staggered board, which is optional, the entire board will not be up for election. Uh, let's just look at an illustration. It's easier to understand through an illustration. So imagine we have a board of directors with seven directors, seven board seats. Uh, this year, three seats will be up for election and four will not. The following year, the next year, four seats will be up for election and three will not. And then it continues on in that pattern forever. Three and four, three and four each year until uh, we change it. Now, what is the purpose of a staggered board? Well, the purpose is to maintain continuity on the board of directors. If each year there's turnover on the board of directors and it's the entire board, then we lose continuity on the board of directors. Um, it can also be used to make it more difficult for the minority shareholders to elect the directors. Remember when we did our cumulative voting formula, we had a denominator and that denominator was based on the number of board seats up for election. The higher the denominator is, the easier it will be for a minority shareholder to uh, elect a director under cumulative voting. Or let me say that in a different way. The higher the denominator is in that formula, the fewer shares a minority shareholder will need to elect one director uh, using cumulative voting. So remember, the denominator is the number of board seats up for election. So if there are seven board seats up for election, a minority shareholder will need fewer shares to elect one director of the board using cumulative voting as opposed to if there are only four board seats up for election. If there are only four board seats up for election, a minority shareholder will need relatively more shares to be able to elect at least one director to the board of directors under a cumulative voting scheme. Uh, let's talk briefly about removing directors. We've already mentioned this, that shareholders can remove directors. Shareholders have a right to initiate this. This is not one of the uh, shareholder action items that requires a board proposal first. A shareholder can say, I would like to propose that we remove a director. It usually has to be done at a special meeting. Usually, shareholders do not need cause to remove a director. They just have to say, we want to remove this director. Uh, when we uh, uh, vote to remove directors, we don't do straight voting or cumulative voting. We just have a vote of the shareholders. The proposal is uh, to remove the director, and then we vote. Uh, usually it's a simple majority to remove the director. There are special protections, however. So if a director, let's say we want to remove a director, but if that director is uh, elected by a class of stock, for example, imagine we have, we've given this example before, imagine we have three classes of stock, class A, class B, class C, and class A stock have the right to elect one director, class B stockholders have the right to elect uh, one director, and class C stockholders have the right to elect one director. When we want to remove the class A director, only the class A stockholders can remove the class A director. Uh, right? So only the shareholders of that class may remove the director. Um, if a director was uh, elected by cumulative voting, then you may not remove the director uh, if there is, excuse me, you may not remove the director if the votes against removing the director would have been sufficient 
to elect her to the board of directors under cumulative voting. So imagine this. Imagine I'm a minority shareholder. And I have just enough shares to elect one director. Right? So I elect one director using cumulative voting. And then a month later, the majority shareholder says, I propose we remove your director. And then we vote on that with a majority vote. Well, who has the majority of the shares? The majority shareholder. And so the majority shareholder will be able to remove that director. That's why we have this protection. If the votes against removing the director, and naturally I'm going to vote against removing that director. If the votes against removing that director would have been sufficient to elect the director under cumulative voting, then you cannot remove the director. Voting on other matters. We know that shareholders vote on other matters. They vote on mergers, amending the articles, uh, they vote on dissolution, and they vote on sale of substantially all of the assets. Later in, uh, in the course, we'll go through the voting procedures and voting standards for all of these fundamental transactions. All right, so what are voting standards? Well, the voting standards will either be in the Articles of Incorporation or the bylaws, or they will be default voting standards uh, under the corporate law statute. So to understand the voting standards, let's just have an illustration, and we'll work through the illustration using the various different possible voting standards for shareholders. So let's imagine that our corporation has 150,000 shares authorized. That's in the Articles of Incorporation. Uh, it has 1,000 shares issued and outstanding. 60,000 shares actually attend the meeting, either in person or by proxy. So not all of the shareholders and not all of the shares are present at the meeting. Only 60,000 shares are present at the meeting and can be voted at the meeting. 55,000 shares vote on the matter. 5,000 abstain for one reason or another. Okay? So now the question is, will the proposal pass? Well, how many shares do we need for the proposal to pass? How many shares voted in favor of the proposal do we need for the proposal to pass? Well, there are three different standards, and you have to read your corporate law statute or the bylaws or the Articles of Incorporation to understand what your corporation requires. But your corporation, either through the bylaws, the articles, or through the default voting standard under the law, might require a simple majority. So for this proposal to pass, whatever the proposal is, we would need 30,001 shares voted in favor of the transaction. Now, this is based on 60,000 shares in attendance. A simple majority is a majority of the shares in attendance at the meeting. So let's look at what we've ignored. First, we've ignored the authorized shares. Remember, authorized shares are not necessarily voting shares. Only issued and outstanding shares are voted. So we have 100,000 shares issued and outstanding. That's how many shares are eligible to vote in this corporation. But only 60,000 attend the meeting. So simple majority standard is a majority of the shares in attendance. And a majority of the shares in attendance would be 30,000 plus one. That's a majority. That's what we call a simple majority. A majority of the shares in attendance. What would be an absolute majority? Well, an absolute majority in this case would be 50,001. So an absolute majority is based on the total number of shares issued and outstanding. So if your bylaws or your articles or the default standard under the law calls for an absolute majority voting standard, then to pass this proposal, whatever this proposal is, uh, 50,001 shares must be voted in favor of the proposal. 
That's a majority of all shares entitled to vote. And in this case, we have 100,000 shares entitled to vote, even though only 60,000 attended the meeting. So we would need 50,000 and one shares voted in favor of the pro proposal to pass this proposal under an absolute majority voting standard. Finally, let's talk about votes cast majority. And a votes cast majority is a term I made up. We're just looking for majority of the votes actually cast. It's really a plurality standard. Um, in this case, if the jurisdiction adopts a votes cast majority, or if that's what the bylaws say, or if that's what the Articles of Incorporation say, then we would need 27,501 shares voted in favor of the proposal. Why? Because we only count a majority of the votes actually cast. And in this case, 5,000 shares were not voted. For whatever reason, uh, the shareholders who owned those 5,000 shares abstained for voting, from voting. And only 50,000 shares, 55,000, excuse me, were actually voted on this proposal. To pass this proposal, 27,501 shares must be voted in favor of the proposal. It's really a plurality standard because we're looking at what gets the most votes out of yes, no, and abstain. And in this case, yes, got the most votes. Okay. Now, for any of these, your bylaws, your articles, or the default standard could change it to a supermajority. So we could have a supermajority, simple majority, right? Or we could have, or maybe I should say, a simple supermajority, or an absolute supermajority, or a votes cast supermajority. And in that case, instead of just looking at 50% plus one, we're looking at maybe 67% or two thirds plus one, or 75% or 90%, or whatever the standard is in the bylaws, the articles, or the Articles of Incorporation. So a majority is just 50% plus one. A supermajority would be 67%, 75%, 90%, or just some number more than a majority. So once again, you can have a simple majority or you can have a simple supermajority standard. You can have an absolute majority standard or you can have an absolute supermajority standard. Or you can have a vote cast majority or a vote cast supermajority standard. You have to read your statute or the bylaws or the articles to discover what is the voting standard for this proposal in your corporation. Let's talk about amending the bylaws. Shareholders may amend the bylaws without board approval, right? And the shareholders have the right to initiate a shareholder proposal, excuse me, a bylaw amendment. So I can go to a shareholders meeting and say, I'm a shareholder, I propose we amend the bylaws in the following way. And the other shareholders will vote on it, even if the board doesn't like it. We do not need board approval to amend the uh, bylaws. Now, here's the thing, the board also has the right to amend the bylaws without shareholder approval. So this is the question. What happens if the shareholders amend the bylaws at a shareholders meeting, and then a week later at the board meeting, the board says, let's change it back. Let's amend it back. Well, here's the solution. The shareholders amendment, the shareholders know that this is possible, and the shareholder amendment can actually say that the board is prohibiting, prohibited from changing this bylaw amendment back or prohibited from changing this bylaw amendment in any way without shareholder approval. So the, the, board, the shareholders can protect their bylaw amendment by putting that clause in the bylaw. Um, the bylaws themselves just might have a general clause that says uh, if the shareholders adopt an amendment to these bylaws, the board cannot change that amendment without shareholder approval. 
All right, let's talk about amending the Articles of Incorporation. It's a little bit bigger deal to amend the Articles of Incorporation. Remember, we said the Articles of Incorporation is like the constitution of the corporation. It has the most important provisions uh, in the Articles of Incorporation. And that means amending it should be more difficult. So the board can amend some minor ministerial items in the uh, Articles of Incorporation without shareholder approval. So, for example, I'm not going to go through all of the things that the board can amend without shareholder approval, but they're really not of huge consequence. So imagine our corporation is called ABC Corp. And the board says, you know, we don't like Corp, we'd rather have ABC Inc. And so the board can change ABC Corp to ABC Inc. in the Articles of Incorporation without shareholder approval. All right, so simple things like that. You can read your statute and see what types of things the board can change without shareholder approval, but all other things. Otherwise, the board must get shareholder approval to uh, amend the Articles of Incorporation. Now, one important issue is that if we have different classes of stock, we have to understand how the different classes of stock will get to vote on the amendment to the Articles of Incorporation. So let's look at what we call class voting. So here's the setup for class voting. And we're talking about class voting in amending the Articles of Incorporation because that's where it's most important. So imagine our corporation has a thousand common shares issued and outstanding. We have a common stock and we have preferred stock. We have a thousand common shares issued and outstanding and we have only 100 preferred shares issued in outstanding. And let's say that the rights of our preferred shares in the Articles of Incorporation is as follows. Each preferred share has a right to a $10 dividend preference. In other words, before the common stock can get any dividend, each preferred share is entitled to a $10 dividend. Um, also, each preferred shared in our corporation has voting rights equal to one share of common stock. So each of the common stock and the preferred stock, each share is entitled to one vote on whatever matter, including amendment of the Articles of Incorporation. Now here's a proposal. This proposal is brought before the shareholders. There's a proposal to amend the Articles of Incorporation to reduce the preferred share dividend to $5 per share. Remember, in the Articles of Incorporation, each preferred share has a $10 dividend preference. The proposal is to amend the articles so that each preferred share will only have a $5 dividend preference. If you're a preferred shareholder, you can imagine how you feel about this. You do not like this. This is the voting results. This proposal is submitted to the shareholders for voting and naturally, all of the common shareholders like this idea. So they vote in favor of this amendment to the Articles of Incorporation. Naturally, all of the preferred shareholders are opposed to this idea. So all of the preferred shares are voted against. Who wins? Well, it looks like the proposal passes, right? Why? Because uh, a majority of the shares were voted in favor of amending the Articles of Incorporation. That's the setup for class voting. That's just general voting, it's not class voting. How would class voting protect the preferred shareholders? All right, so let's talk about how class voting protects the preferred shareholders. Remember our voting results were that a thousand common shares voted in favor of the amendment to the Articles of Incorporation and 100 preferred shares, all of them were voted against amendment of the Articles of Incorporation. If you have class voting rights under the law, and if you read your corporate law statute, you will see that there are times where a class of shares will have class voting rights, and this is one of them. If you have class voting rights, your class of shareholders can veto a proposal simply by voting against it. Once again, if you have class voting rights, 
the class of shareholders can veto a proposal simply by not approving it. So let's look at general voting, right? We said our general voting resulted in the proposal passing. The amendment to the Articles of Incorporation to reduce the preferred dividend from $10 to $5 under general voting passes. Why? 1,000 voted in favor, 100 voted against. The proposal passes under general voting. But this proposal, uh, under the law, under the corporate law statute, the preferred shareholders will get class voting protection, which means they can veto this proposal simply by voting against it. So in our case, we know that the preferred shareholders get class voting rights. Zero voted in favor, 100 voted against, the proposal fails the class voting. Because the proposal failed the class voting and also because the preferred shareholders were entitled to class voting for this proposal, the proposed amendment does not pass. Even though all of the common shareholders voted in favor and even though they overwhelmingly beat the preferred shareholders' votes, shareholders, the preferred shareholders have class voting, which means they can veto the proposal simply by voting it down, and they voted it down. Um, one other interesting thing about class voting, imagine you have a class of shares with no voting rights under the Articles of Incorporation. You can do this. You can have a class of shares that only has economic rights and no voting rights under the Articles of Incorporation. Under the statutory law, even this type of share, even this class of shares, even no voting shares will get class voting for certain proposals and they will get to vote on this type of transaction. So in this example, imagine our preferred stockholders had no voting rights under the Articles of Incorporation they would still get class voting rights and they would still be able to vote this proposal down simply by voting against it. 